There's great TV pleasure at your command. Hello out there from TV land. Nick at night brings it home to you. Nick at night. Anybody remember those shows, Nick at night? Favorite TV shows of comedy years? Well, I've been uh, critiqued over the last week about sports metaphors. And somebody told me, said, Bruce, do you know that there's people out there that do not like sports? <laughs> it, it absolutely blew me away that there would be some people that would not or would not even think about sports metaphors. So I thought, well, okay. If they don't like sports metaphors, what could I use to allow them to understand that being a fan is not necessarily a sports team fan. It could be another type of fan. So we went with TV shows, old, iconic TV shows. And I want you to think back in the days that you were watching the old shows and what your favorite TV show was that you would not miss. If school got out at 3.30, you would run as fast as you could to get home to watch a TV show. And mine was Hogan's Heroes. Anybody like Hogan's Heroes? I gotta have me some Hogan's Heroes. I don't even care if it was a rerun. If I saw a rerun of a Hogan's Heroes show, I got excited because I knew what was going to take place. I like some Hogan's Heroes. And I would not miss a Hogan's Heroes episode if I could ever possibly try to. So what is it that you would not miss? What is it that you would schedule your entire night around? Whether it is a Friday night, date night, that you know from 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock, from 9 o'clock, all the shows are going to line up. And if somebody asks you to go out, you're going to say, eh, can we go out Friday night? Or what about Sunday night? I really don't want to miss my TV show. We all have them. We all are fans of certain types of shows. When we look at what types of fans, I have some catchphrases. And I want you, if you not understand the catchphrase from the old TV shows, I want you to scream it out, okay? I want you to scream it out and see who can get it first. Here's Johnny. All right, that was a, that was a pretty easy one. Yada, yada, yada. Seinfeld. We're going to get to the Flintstone here in a second. Uh, what you talking about, Willis? Different strokes. The tribe has spoken. Okay? And that's the way it was. Walter Cronkite. All right. Come on down! All right, some of you guys are getting into that Price is Right stuff, aren't you? Look! Up at the sky! It's a bird! It's a plane! It's... All right. Yabba dabba doo! There you go. Ruh -roh. The Jetsons. Ruh -roh. Danger Will Robinson. Danger Will Robinson. Lost in Spain. To the Batmobile. This tape will destruct in 30 seconds. Live long and prosperous. These are getting easy, aren't they? Book him, Dano. <laughs> Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. <laughs> oh, man. That's dynamite! All right. Okay, this is part of this, so don't, I'm not saying this. See, if any of the, you have to be over 60 years old to get this one, okay? Kiss my grits. Flow, flow, flow. <laughs> I wasn't going to do that one. I thought I had to, though. Okay. Okay. <laughs> There's one more I want to try to find here. Um, oh, well, let's forget it. Okay. <laughs> Some of these are, they're not all Christian perspectives, so I was trying to pick out the good ones that I could say in church without getting in trouble. Okay. So, when you're looking at catchphrases and things that's going on and things that you like and things that you remember, there's always type of things with a, a show that's going to catch your mind. A show that all you have to do is listen to the song of the iconic songs of the past. You're going to go to your mind and you're going to remember that TV show or you'll remember that movie. Those are the shows that have ingrained within our life. I want to say that sometimes being a fan of a show, being a fan of an event, is something that we enjoy but it doesn't do any transformation. 
What we want to do is we want to talk about what is it that we are a fan of that transforms our lives to be followers and dedicated followers of Christ. Next week, we're going to take, we're not going to do sports again next week. I'm going to hit some of you ladies big time next week, okay? So this is, um, that's what I'm going for. I mean, the guys, we hit it the first two weeks on sports. Next week, we're using novels. Uh Uh-oh. We're going to use, let's say, Fifty Shades of Grey. Oh, okay. No, I didn't read that. I don't know what that's talking about. Or we may talk about Harry Potter. We're going to talk about different novels that once we pick those books up, we'll spend hours reading those books. And we're enthroned with those books. We want to read it. We want to get done with it. It may be Louis Lamar for, for the Westerns, for us guys, but there's certain books that we sit down and we will not take a break until we watch and we read the entire book. Well, the analogy then will be, if we love the book so much, why don't we read a book not for entertainment, but for transformation? And if we are a fan, we've got to take what is important and change our lives. In Luke chapter 9, verses 23, it says this, Then he said to them, If anyone wants to come with me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and daily follow me. So church, what Jesus is saying in his ministry, he goes, guys, I don't care what you do. I don't care about your enjoyment. I don't care about your free time. What I want you to do is I want you to realize that I need to be the priority of your life. I need you to take up your cross, not weekly. I need you to take up your cross daily and follow me. So in, we're talking about in John chapter 3, We're talking about a guy by the name of Nicodemus, and the idea of Nick at night was Nicodemus came to Jesus at night, and he was inquisitive to say the least. He was wondering what all this stuff was talking about. He was a Pharisee. He was the Christian leader of the day. He was one of the highest in the church, and Jesus came into town, and and at the start, he was turning water into wine. He was healing the sick. He was casting out leprosy. And the religious leaders of the day were watching Jesus do his thing. And they were inquisitive about the power that Jesus had. They didn't understand what it meant to be born again. The terminology was brand new with Jesus. Now, nowadays we have the term born again all over the place. Jimmy Carter, president, you say, I was born again. And, and then the, all the conservatives thought, yeah, we have somebody born again in the White House, but we found out his born again was not biblical born again. It was his own perspective. Now we have Madonna that says she has her baby. Now she's born again. The born again that Jesus is talking about is not a fleshly born again. It's a born again of a spiritual nature. And what we're going to do is talk about today, what does it mean to be born again in our culture? How can we take Nicodemus, a religious leader that knew everything in his head, he understood the laws, he understood everything about the church, but he didn't understand the aspect of transformation, to be an absolute dedicated follower of Christ. He wanted to love the church, but he didn't understand Jesus. And to be a committed follower of Christ, we have to understand what Jesus truly wants for us. Following is a choice. Following is a commitment. And following takes action. It takes something. And we need to do what it asks us to do. So, let's first look in John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. And let's set the tone. We understand that Nicodemus has watched Jesus perform miracles. We have watched Jesus heal the sick. He saw Jesus turn water into wine. He saw Jesus come and do great things that they've never experienced before. It was obvious that Jesus was sent from God and doing miracles by God. It was obvious because nobody else could do these things. But here's what he said. In John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, and we're going to dissect this thing down. He said this, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, We know that you are a teacher from God, for no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. Then Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You cannot even see the kingdom of God. So there's a lot of things going on here, but 
Nicodemus is saying, I see what you're doing. I don't understand how you're doing it. I understand that you are sent from God. And Jesus is trying to say, you know, you can see everything from your perspective, but until you become born again, until you have the spiritual lens that you can see what I'm doing out of the Spirit, you're going to say, I enjoy what you're doing, but I haven't experienced what you have. And Jesus wants total commitment, and Nicodemus says, I want to see what I can get from you, or I want to see what you can do. Will you join my ranks? Can you be part of the Sanhedrin? Can we rally around you? And Jesus said, no, 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 no. You will never understand what spirituality is about, what Christianity is going to be about if you get past what I'm trying to do. So he goes on, and he starts trying to talk about the conflict. The conflict that Nicodemus had. The conflict was he tried to understand Jesus with his own mentality and his own spiritual standard. And sometimes we try to understand what God is doing within our own life, in our own intellect, in our own spiritual standard, in what we think God should do or what we want God to do. And if we try to dissect what God is doing within our life by what we understand, he's going to say the same thing to you. You will not understand spirituality until you first understand my ways, understand my heart. And how do you do that? First, you have to be born again. Born again is just accepting what Jesus Christ has done for you. Not just having your fire insurance, not just going to church, but understand that Jesus wants transformation within our life. He, Nicodemus admits, he said, you must be uh, uh, sent from God. No, nobody other than God could do these great things. So he opens up the door. He respects Jesus because he understands he's a rabbi. He understands he's a teacher. But he's doing things that's unique. He's doing things that's fresh. He's doing things that's new. And Nicodemus is curious on what in the world is taking place. But then Jesus says something to him. Let's, first he says this. He says, we must be born again because there's a nature of the kingdom. There's a nature of the kingdom. In other words, Nicodemus saw that Jesus was sent from God. There's a nature of God's kingdom. Now, the second thing is we must be born again because of the nature of the flesh. The nature of the flesh. We all understand our flesh. We understand our flesh gets us in trouble. We understand that Nicodemus is trying to do good. Their mindset is if I know the law, if I understand the law, if I make everybody try to obey the law, then I am going to get better and I'm going to be in a higher position and I will be okay with God because I'm doing everything the law says I should do. In many churches, we try to be good enough to go to heaven. And we can't be good enough to go to heaven. Kevin's song that sang so well, being redeemed, he, he, he says he started thinking about all the things that he used to do within his life. And he can't get out of his past until he met Jesus. And when Jesus came into his life, he was, what's the word? Redeemed. That means he's bought from. He's, he's not held to that account. And sometimes in churches today, we get caught in the legalistic mindset that I have to live good enough I have to be something in order to be redeemed. And Jesus is trying to communicate to Nicodemus in this next phase here. He says, it's not about your position in the church. It's not about what you know and what you do. It's not about the heritage in which you come from. It's not about you being a Jew. And it's not about what you have done. There's a different perspective from being born again. In our analogy today, it doesn't make any difference if your mom and dad go to church. It doesn't make any difference if they have been to church all their life and you've been to church all your life. It doesn't change the fact that you individually must be born again in order to receive the salvation of Jesus. And it is a personal act of worship. Now, it goes on in John chapter 3, verses 4 through 8. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most surely I say unto you, unless one is born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. 
That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Say, when you are a child of God, and you use the terminology of born again, you're not entering into your mother's room to be born again. But what it is, once you have received the Holy Spirit's power, and once you've accepted the gift of salvation that Jesus Christ has given to us, we are going to make an impact. We are going to be able to be what God wants us to be. We cannot continue to try to live in the Spirit on the outside perspective, but not have the Spirit within our life. We're trying to live what we call a dichotomy, living in the flesh with acts of the Spirit. And when we live in the flesh in our life, but yet we want people to think that we have a spiritual nature, what we have is we are confused. We're tossed to and fro. We have no idea what we're going to do. And Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, you can't do both. You will never understand the work of God until you understand the salvation being born again is of a spirit. It's not of the flesh. You cannot understand what I'm getting ready to do until you give up your religious prestige and give up and give in to my humility of accepting that there's only one way to heaven. And it is not about positional religion. It's about humility and saying, I am going to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. So often, we have a lot of religious fanatics that tell us what we should do in order for us to be successful. And they could tell us, and they can tell us all the laws, what you should or what you should not do, or what you can or what you cannot do. And all those things are good, and they're all probably right to a certain extent. But all the good you do, everything that you try to do, every penny that you try to give, every sermon that you try to listen to, all of those things are good for us. But it all boils down, all those things are the works, unless we first boil down our hearts and we get down and say, Lord, I need you as my Lord and Savior. And once I have accepted you, I have been born again. Then, after I am born again, after I've come to the point that that is my beginning point, then I can start doing certain things. Then the wind of my life will blow and people will hear it and people will experience it. But I cannot live in the flesh and try to act like I'm in the spirit and have God's power within my life. When we try to do that, what we become, we become tossed to and fro, and what happens is we become hypocritical, and then there is no, there's no joy within our life. We wonder what takes place. We wonder why things are falling apart, because we cannot do certain things, and when we can't do them, we get frustrated. And then when we get frustrated, what we do is we quit. You have to be born again, verse 8 reminds us. We do not know where the wind comes from, and we don't understand it. You need to put a date to your conversion. It's not a salvational thing. It's a testimony thing. I would challenge us. You know, some of us were, were saved when we were six, seven, eight years old. Some of us were baptized be, before, you know, before we even started school. But some of us were... 18, 19 years of age. Some of us were 30 and 40, and some of us maybe even 60 or 70 years old when we were saved. Salvation is important. Now, you may not need to know where you were, what you were doing, the place, the time, the event, and you could tell, but there should be a, a, an opportunity for you in your salvation experience to say, there is a time. There was a time where I did not know Christ, and I was living my life for my flesh, and I was living my life for myself, but there was a point where something took place, an event took place. Maybe something horrific took place, or maybe it was God's ordained moment in time for your salvation, and you say, that was it. That was when the light bulb clicked off in my mind, and I said, yes. I am going to humble myself, and I'm not going to live in the flesh anymore. I'm going to live for Christ, and I'm going to accept him as my Lord and Savior. Now, if there's a moment... If there's a time, I would encourage you to ingrain that, write it in the Bible, put it in your mind, because that is the moment that Jesus wants you to start 
living your spiritual life in. You cannot be held back because of your past. Pre-salvation. You have to say, you know what? That's who I was. I was in the flesh. And we say this all the time. Sinners are supposed to do what? Sin. But once you're saved, once you have given your life to Christ, once you're born again, that salvation experience should be the transformation start. It should be something that we enjoyed in the past because that's what we were supposed to do. But once salvation occurred, the past is under the blood of Jesus Christ, we should say no to the past, open up the opportunity for Christ to forgive us today, and move into a radical, transformed life into the future. If that moment in time is something that you have no idea that took place, Maybe that you've always gone to church. Maybe you've always done something. Maybe it's something that we have done old hat. We're just like Nicodemus. We know all about church. We know all about the law. But you're sitting here today and say, what in the world is this born again thing? And Jesus is trying to get to us and say, you know what, the bottom line, Nicodemus? You could be a ruler of the church. You could be the head of the synagogue. Everybody in the church could think that you're the most important, most pious, most important spiritual person that they've ever known. And that's all in the flesh. Because people will not perceive what God is doing within your life through flesh. They will perceive what God is doing within your life in the spirit. My witness will bear witness with your spirit. And what we then can do is we can do great things for the kingdom of God. So the moment of transformation, the moment of salvation is that key moment. Uh, we, Nicodemus did not have a transformation. He, had inquisi he was inquisitive about what he was seeing. He did not understand it because he was not in the spirit. He was in the flesh. Then we must be born again because the nature of our Savior. Because the nature of our Savior. In verses 8 through 14 it says this. The wind blows where it wishes. And you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly I say to you, We speak what we know and we testify what we have seen, and you do not, you do not receive our witness. If I told you earthly things and you do believe. How will you believe if I tell you the heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven but he who has come down from heaven. That is my son of man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up. What does all that mean? That means that Jesus is trying to tell uh, Nicodemus. He said, guys, he said, the spirit of salvation changes everything. And, and he was trying to get to the point of, of when the, the fall of man took place, when Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve were in the garden and they, they broke the commitment and the covenant with God. And God started walking through the garden because he had fellowship with them every day and they were naked and they were not shamed and they just talked with God. And then when the covenant with God was broken, they hid from God. And from that moment on, when the covenant was broken and they hid from God, mankind has always tried to bring back that relationship. They have always tried to bring back that relationship. And mankind in their flesh has always said, if I am good enough, God will love me. If I try hard enough, God will restore because I know that one time in an innate desire within my soul, I want to have fellowship with God, but because of sin, I can't get to God. So God said in his infinite mind, he said, I know that man cannot get to me, so what I am going to do, I'm going to have a covenant made up, and that covenant that I'm going to make up is I'm going to send my son, and I'm going to send my son from heaven to this earth, a perfect child. And the only way man is going to be able to have reunion with God is if they accept the blood of my son for the salvation of their life. And that is going to be the reunion of God and man 
reconciliation so they can have fellowship with me for eternity. Now, in the mind, you would say, how in the world does that take place? You can say it and you can debate and you can talk to a postmodern world where there is no absolute truth and they would say, this born again thing doesn't make sense. I am good enough, I can do my own thing. I can be my own thing. I can accomplish whatever I want. And Jesus is telling Nicodemus, he said this, he said, you can't do it on your own. You can't be spiritual if you're carnal. You can't understand the spiritual unless you understand that Jesus completed what was taking place. And all the way back, it says in the last verse, even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. What was all that about? When Moses wandered in the wilderness, there, was, there were snakes. And any time that anybody got bit by the snakes, they were dying. And Moses was talking to God and said, what, are we, what, what should we do? And then God told Moses, he said, make a bronze serpent and put it on a pole and tell everybody, this is in the Old Testament, tell everybody that if you are bit by the serpent, bit by sin, if bit by your life that's biting you, that's, that's keeping you from life, if you are bit and you're about ready to die, all you have to do is look and look at the serpent on the bronze pole and you will be healed. All the way back in Exodus, God told the people of us today that when you are bit in life and you are struggling in life and you do not understand what salvation is all about and you're trying to have fellowship with God and you're trying to reunion, have a reunion back with God, all we have to do is look and see Jesus. Because Jesus did die on the cross. Jesus did develop a plan for our life. We can be a fan of church. We can be a fan of a lot of things. We can see what Jesus can do in your life just as Nicodemus saw it and we can come to other people and say, what did Jesus do? How could he do this for your life? How did he fix your marriage? How did he fix your finances? How did he change your life? And we could see all the things that God has done and we can be a fan of what God can do. But until we are willing to say, God, I need you. I need you. I cannot do this on my own. I have failed miserably. I may be a spiritual leader. I may be a Pharisee, if you will. I may be a spiritual on top of the world guy. I may know a lot about the Bible. I could debate people to, to and fro about every issue from Genesis to Revelation, and I want to talk about people, and I want to talk about the Word of God, and you know a lot about the Bible. But do you know the author of the Bible? A lot of times, we have been so caught up in being a fan of what Jesus did, we lose sight of who Jesus was. And in our church world today, let me put the rubber on the road. We enjoy what Jesus has done. We enjoy the church feeling. We enjoy the song service. We enjoy the sermon of inspiration. But we're not willing to get on our knees and take effect what Jesus Christ wants to do within our life, and that's to transform us. We like being a fan, but we don't want to be committed to Jesus. What do we do about that? I believe sometimes in a church setting, what we have to do is we all have to put ourselves in Nicodemus's life. See, Nicodemus didn't want to come to Jesus in broad daylight. Nicodemus wanted to come to Jesus alone, in the dark, where nobody would see him, where he could sneak in, he could talk. And this was a small discourse in the Bible, but I believe truly the small discourse probably took all night. I believe Jesus and Nicodemus discussed all kinds of different things. He discussed things, and Jesus was saying, I could tell you until you're blue in the face all the reasons of everything that has took place all the way back from Genesis up to this point. But the bottom line, you'll never understand the things of the Spirit unless you first accept me as your salvation. And as a church, I'm saying this. Let's quit just being a fan. 
You know, I hear comments all the time about, about commitment level. Uh, 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 you know, commitment, everybody's on a commitment level. Everybody wants to do certain things. Everybody likes doing certain things. And just because you don't like doing what somebody else, it doesn't mean that they're more committed than you or you're more committed than them, that they, they're not as spiritual because they don't do certain things. You know, when God calls you, he's, he's given you a desire within your soul to worship him and to honor him and gifts in order to serve. If we have a commitment level, we must give our commitment to Christ whether it's through the body of Christ or whether it's outside the church, we must serve people. That is our commitment to Christ, to bring people to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. What is a committed follower of Jesus Christ look like? What does it look like? If you would in your mind think, I know a committed follower of Jesus Christ, what would he or she look like? And I promise you, he or she in your mind will not live up to the standard that God has for them. Because we look in a certain place, and we look at what people have, and we look at what people do, but they, just like you, have their own insecurities, their own issues within life, and they have to do the same thing that you have to do. Every morning, the Bible says, we have to take up the cross and follow me. Every morning. If we don't do it on a morning basis, on a daily basis, whether your perception of them is great or they fail in front of you, it's because it's a daily basis. If you say, well, I don't feel like I'm on fire for God every day, I understand. It's a daily basis. You say, well, sometimes I go a month without reading the Bible. I understand. It's a daily basis. Sometimes I never pray. I know. It's a daily basis. It's evident of our salvation experience when transformation takes place, that the Bible says, in order for us to understand what Christ has done for us, in Luke chapter 9, then he said to them, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. That is the hardest thing that a church and any one of us can do, is to get away from being a fan of church, a fan of Jesus a fan of what he can do and do a daily commitment and get up and follow. Now, I love what takes place when that takes place. I love when somebody gets to the point and they gave their life to Christ and they get up. Uh, let's use the illustration. We have a, we have a, a family that's having a, uh, a baby in surgery. Her name is Kelsey and it's Todd and Jennifer Williams and they're in uh, Chicago right now and uh, they had the surgery on Thursday and the surgery went well but on Friday at 1030 the baby blue uh, blue coated and uh, they were doing chest compressions and and they were scared to death that the baby went through surgery everything was great at the surgery then a few hours later uh, some problems took place uh, you know they were calling us we were praying for them and we were talking to them well just yesterday they went through all the stuff, and Todd calls, and he said, Bruce, I don't understand what God is doing. But he said, it seemed like God just looked at her and said, you're not, you're not going to go anywhere. I've got plans for you. And he said, from that moment at 1030 on a Friday night when the baby blue-lined, or flat-lined, or whatever they call it, from then on, the blood pressure, the whole, the vitals, have been perfect. This boy is a brand new believer. A brand new believer. Probably within the last couple months. And on the phone to me, he said, I could not imagine doing this without Jesus being my Lord. That, to me, is saying, he gets it. He gets it. Your most prized possession, your child. Your child, laying on an operating table, going in ICU for three days with open chest, open heart surgery, and you're hopeless and helpless. And you're thinking, why me? Why does all this have to happen? But yet, when you give over to God, and God does something, and you can say, thanks God. That, I believe, is when you walk in the Spirit, 
and you see what God is doing and you see things through God's eyes and not through our eyes. Because there are all kinds of stuff. Every situation, every day, when you look through your eyes, through your lens, you can get mad at God. You can get mad at the church. You can get mad at your preacher. You can get mad at your wife. You can get mad at your husband. You can get mad at your kids because you're looking through the lens of your eyes to the world. And Jesus was telling Nicodemus, he said, guys, you'll never understand my ways. You'll never understand what I want for you until you first look through the lens of the Spirit. What is your plan for life? And your plan for life is not about you. It's not about what you get. It's about getting your life in the proper order. And the proper order is this. You have to know Jesus. You can't just be a fan. You have to be a committed follower of Christ. You may be the highest religious leader of the day. And Jesus, I don't care your position. I don't care about your influence. I don't care what people think of you. I'm telling you this. Unless you are born of the Spirit, you'll never see the kingdom of God. Now, Jesus is saying, I, I don't care about you. I don't care about how much you have, the influence that you have. I care deeper about you. I care about your salvation. And the first term, are you born again? So my challenge today, I'm sure we have some Nicodemuses in here. I'm sure we have some people in here that are questioning the things of God. Why all this stuff is taking place. Why do I have all the problems? Or maybe you're questioning Jesus and you're saying, I think I'm already good enough. Or why don't you join my team instead of me joining your team? Why don't you give me, give me, give me? And Jesus saying, you know what? Back off. I don't need you to be a fan. I don't even need you to like me. Because Jesus is saying this. He said, you know what? I'm here for more than you to like me. I'm here to transform you. And the gospel is at a point where if you do not look at the gospel through the lens of the Spirit, you're not going to like the gospel. You're not going to like Jesus. Jesus is going to love you. But you look at the gospel, and the gospel is pretty black and white in a lot of different ways. Unless you love Jesus, you're going to look at the gospel and say, you know what? Ah, that's not for me. But once you give your life to Christ and you bow your knee and say, thank you, and then you understand that I have been reconciled from the flesh to the spirit. I have been saved. I've been redeemed. I'm going to heaven. My sins have been forgiven. Then you look at the word of God and you say, huh, he loves me. The book is for me to get closer to him daily. Then we understand I'm not just a fan. I'm a dedicated committed follower of Jesus. You want to see a church? Do you want to see a life? Do you want to see a family transformed? Quit being a fan of the church. Quit being a fan of Jesus. Be a committed follower. A dedicated unyielding follower of Jesus. And say I will do whatever you want me to do. It may start with you first being introduced to the one that can transform your life. Many of us have gone through life with a roller coaster ride. And many of us are saying, I've done this before. I've been here before. I've heard sermons before. But nothing has ever transformed my life. I'm saying, until you take up your cross and follow me, until you get to the point that you understand, I need something to change my life. And Jesus' salvation is not a magic pill. It's not something you're going to come down at the front and you're going to say a prayer and you're going to walk out and everything's going to be great. No, you're going to walk down here. You're going to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior because of what he's done on the cross for your sins and you are going to be transformed. But in the midst of that transformation, the word of God is your blueprint in order to get to where God wants you to be. Everything works together. If you feel like that you're a void from God, you feel like there's a big barrier between you and anything spiritual, you feel like God is not anywhere close to your life, you feel like there's problems at every turn, you feel like you enjoy the things 
but you don't have a relationship with God. You are a fan of the thing, but you're not a committed follower of who the thing is. And that's Jesus. We need to be committed followers. We can watch TV shows and be entertained. We can plan a night, a plan a weekend, and we can watch TV shows and we can laugh and we can enjoy ourselves and we can get rid of the world's problems because of a TV show. And that's fun for a couple hours. But once that TV show gets turned off, reality is back on and you deal with truth. The TV show was fun, but doesn't change your life. I need somebody that's going to radically change my life. I need Jesus to not only be in my life, to be control of my life. So my challenge, are you a fan? Or are you committed? Do you have Jesus as the Lord of your life? If he is not, we are going to go through this deja vu over and over and over again. Nicodemus came to Jesus at night because he was ashamed. Jesus called it black and called it white and said, if you do not have the Spirit of God within your life, you will never understand the things of God. If you do not understand the things of God, come to Jesus with a pure heart, an open heart, and you say, Lord, what must I do to be saved? And let the Word of God change you. And I guarantee you, it will radically change everything about you. First, we have to come to him. Once we come to him, we will see the world through the lens of the spirit and not the lens of the flesh. That is a wonderful thing. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you and Lord, we thank you for your love to us and I pray that you'll guide within our life. And Lord... It's easy sometimes to come to you when we're alone at night, when nobody's around, when we're contemplating the things within our soul and the things within our mind, and we can ask you questions. Lord, just like Nicodemus did this at night, you confronted him. He did not understand the things of God. He understands the things of the church. He understands the rules and the regulations. He didn't understand the spirit. And Lord, I think that sometimes within our church, we make it so easy to come to church to assume the coat of religion that we leave out the intimacy of Jesus. So Lord, I ask you today to take off our coat of religion, the coat of Christianity that we can all hide behind and look deep within our soul of our intimate desire to be a follower of Christ. And if we are sitting here today and we are not happy where we are spiritually, we are not satisfied with who we truly are, Lord, you and you alone know where we are. We can act the religious game. We can play the game all day long. But Lord, you know the truth. So Lord, search our hearts today. Convict us where we failed you. Lord, if we've never accepted you, if we're trying to play the church game in the flesh, we will fail every time. And ultimate end is life in hell without you. So the prize of this is so important. The prize is heaven. The prize is a relationship with you. So allow us not to enjoy church but to me, a committed follower of Jesus. Be with us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you please, if you would stand.